Hi, welcome. I'm Audrey Wenning, the Director of Transportation for the Metropolitan Planning Council, and thank you for joining us tonight. The Metropolitan Planning Council is a nonprofit policy and planning organization that conducts research, advocacy, and technical assistance to support a more prosperous, sustainable, and equitable Chicago region. MPC believes mobility is a human right and universal access to a multimodal, affordable, safe, and reliable an efficient transportation system is a necessary condition to exercising that right. Transportation is key to the Chicago region's economic competitiveness and plays an important role in promoting inclusive growth and environmental sustainability. And we're so thrilled to have such a great turnout for MPC's first ever virtual documentary screening. We wanna thank our event sponsor, Perkins and Will, an architecture firm that seeks to create environments where people live happier, healthier lives. And we also want to thank SmartGo, which connected us to the creators of Life on Wheels. SmartGo is a nonprofit that advocates for mobility that's less dependent on private cars. It's especially timely for us to have this conversation as we're this week as we're anticipating the new Biden-Harris administration taking office in January. We're actively thinking about what transportation policies to advance in the coming years under this new political landscape. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic is very much still with us and is shaping both short-term and potentially long-term transportation trends. The Life on Wheels documentary is act asking us to step back and really think about the trajectory transportation has taken for the past century and how we want to shape it for the future. It asks us to think about the outcomes of transportation choices that evolved our society from a pedestrian oriented one to an auto oriented one. And it discusses how in the past decade or two, we've begun to live in the big data and smartphone era, which has had a dramatic impact on people access to transportation. Autonomous vehicles are on the horizon. And at the same time, we are becoming increasingly aware of many societal conditions that are very impacted by transportation, social inequity, public health, climate change, air quality, we are at a real turning point. Which way do we want to turn? So let me go over our agenda for tonight. After this brief introduction, we'll show the film, which is 65 minutes long. Following the film, we'll have about 45 minutes for a discussion with our esteemed panel, who I will introduce to you now. You're going to really want to stick around after the film for this conversation. So if we move to our, uh, our bios here, you'll see some detailed information about our speakers. We have Andrew Broderick with Perkins and Will. He's an urban designer, and he's gonna help us think about the perspective of how transportation fits into the urban landscape and makes cities livable. We have Romina Castillo, a community planner with Muse Community Design with extensive experience in conducting community engagement in Chicago neighborhoods, and who also works on transportation safety initiatives and equity oriented initiatives with the Vision Zero program. And we're also really excited to welcome Emily Castor Warren, a former policy director for Lyft and now senior policy advisor at Nelson Nygaard. Emily not only appears in the film, she has an extensive understanding of the policy landscape that underpins the transport choice, transportation choices ahead of us. All right, thanks for sticking with us and watching the film. Uh, now we're gonna introduce our panel and have a conversation about what we saw. So if our panelists can, uh, yep, here they come and are turning on their videos. Thank you. Um, so we've had uh, some questions coming in. I wanna encourage people that are watching to please continue to ask questions, but I'll get, started with a, with a few, uh, and some people have actually kind of asked this question in the, uh, in the Q&A. So we have, this film was produced before COVID. It, it was finished about like a couple of weeks before, uh, before the pandemic started, so in the spring. And uh, so I'm, I'm wondering your perspectives on what themes in this film still hold true um, or what change in a post-COVID environment? is? Will COVID and its aftermath change what's possible or desirable? So um, who would like to take that one first? 
Uh, this is Andrew. I'll, I'll, I'll start with Andrew okay. Broderick. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, some, I think a lot in this film will remain true post COVID. I, I really do. Um, the shift that we've seen building up to this over the last 15 years in the digital, with digital innovation, um, I think it'll remain to be true with regards to choice. Um, I think what is going to shift is patterns of people's daily use post COVID with regards to their work com work commute patterns, time of day, um, and hybrid work of work from home. And that can be enabled further by choice, but um, I think that um, that the transportation systems and networks will, there'll be some, there'll be some flux. Yeah, and I can um, chime in right there. Um, I don't think there will be a lot of, or has been, or will be a lot of change. I think actually what would change or, um, it's the way that we prioritize those um, strategies and implementation, and also the urgency in which we implement those concepts or those ideas. Um, I think with COVID, we have seen um, how cities, municipalities, and people have cherished, cherished more of that open space and ability to open the space to people. Um, in many cases, um, I've seen those uh, urbanist memes saying like, oh, you're welcome, America, you discover Europe, or I would add in many cases, Latin America. Um, the idea of really opening spaces to people is one of the concepts that come up during the, the film. And I think, again, as I mentioned, um, I don't think the concepts and the changes will change a lot. It's just how we prioritize and how we implement those changes and concepts. What really struck me in thinking about where we sit today in this kind of COVID world um, versus where we were when that film was made was in kind of the relative um, change in ease or difficulty of implementing some of these things, uh, given the challenges that we're facing or the opportunities that we're facing with COVID. Um, I think we all um, can really agree that in the long term, it'll still be extremely important to gain greater adoption um, of public transit and of uh, walking and cycling. And yet during this period, I think we've seen maybe you know the idea that it'll actually be easier to get more people to participate in active transportation because so many people have been introduced to it during this period of time individual open air modes of transportation have been attractive to people during this period and so they've gained momentum alongside some of the infrastructure quick build solutions that we've seen that Romina mentioned during this time um, and yet on the transit side of things we've and for shared uh, use of, of vehicles, as was discussed in the film, this idea of, of carpooling and of course of mass transit, um, it's become more difficult with respect to retaining participation of riders um, in the, the immediate period of the pandemic, obviously because of people's concerns for transmission. Uh, but I think there, there are ways in which that um, situation has obviously gravely impacted the financial standing of, of transit services. And it, there's gonna be a rebuilding period um, it, during which will be very important to prioritize investment in, um, in the viability of those services financially and also um, customer attraction and you know how we, we restore public confidence, particularly from, you know, I, I kind of hate this term, but like choice riders that, you know, the people who, wealthy people who we're afraid may abandon the system um, and um, undercut the financial viability of this service that's so essential for, for many people and obviously for a lot of the, the policy outcomes um, and, and, and environmental outcomes that we care about. So, um, you know, that's kind of what I think may have shifted during this time. Maybe just one thing to add on an equity note is the economic recession and the impacts and exacerbation of, of, of equity through income levels. And that actually, I think, might have a bigger impact on mobility and choice and cost uh, moving forward even more so than the disease itself. The people are going to need low cost transportation options given that we're going to come out of this in an economic crisis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so the film spends a lot of time talking about um, safety and the underappreciated risks of cars that we just we've accepted and you know here we are in Chicago um, one of the third largest city in the in the country are we seeing an acknowledgement of this risk and, and what are we doing currently to shift transportation policy and I know Romina you have worked a lot on 
um, safety and Vision Zero in Chicago. So what are some of your perspectives on this? Yeah, um, so I think the key word in that question, Audrey, is acknowledging. I think the city and the region has acknowledged and they, they have acknowledged the issue of traffic safety. Um, as far as really shifting um, or improving policy so that this acknowledge acknowledgement goes beyond acknowledging and really a more comprehensive action, action-oriented policies that really change, um, one, how, how our policies and how infrastructure is really improving and protecting the lives of, of people of the region. More specifically, I'm more familiar with Chicago, so I'm just going to state which in Chicago. Um, in Chicago, um, I think that the policies that have been, and I just want to say, they, there has definitely been improvements. Um, the fact that Chicago has adopted Vision Zero um, policies and um, strategies is a, is a great step on the right direction. Um, I know that it's still a, a new um, program or a project in the city and it's still, it's been evolving throughout in, in the last few years. Um, it has been very encouraging that the new commissioner, um, Gia Biagi, has committed to investing more in Vision Zero strategies, so that's great. Um, however, I feel like there's still, there hasn't been a very comprehensive and cross-sectoral approach to safety in the city and policy changing. I feel like a lot when it comes to, to more specifically, infrastructure investment, uh, it's still very politicized in, in Chicago, unfortunately. Uh, the way in which uh, budgeting, uh, many money, everything gets divided. Um, at the end, we end up with uh, piecemeal of improvements instead of a whole comprehensive uh, policy um, across the entire city. Um, so again, I think the acknowledgement, it's, it's great. We're moving on the right direction. There's still a long way for Chicago, again, more specifically. Um, I know the region is also working on it and we have a lot and we've seen a lot of um, advocates uh, speaking up and trying to learn from what we've learned, what we've done in uh, as far as Vision Zero strategies in Chicago to adopt similar um, implementations in, in other parts of the region. Uh, but for Chicago, I would say that we still have a long way to go um, in order to have a real shift in, in policy making and how the city um, really um, acts upon those uh, strategies that have been set. Um, they, I, and I know also that you know, the Department of Transportation has, you know, really been good at setting up those uh, strategies. But again, it's it only usually just relies on one department in the city rather than having the buying of of the entire um, of other departments and also the mayor's office. So, um, yes, acknowledgement is great. We really want to see a little bit more of implementations and real policy changes across the city. Thanks, Romina. Um, I don't know if Andrew or Emily, you want to add anything, or or we can we can continue. I'll defer to the Chicago experts on this. Okay. One. Yeah, sure. That was a pretty specific Chicago specific question. It's certainly, it's certainly something that uh, all cities are wrestling with, and 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 really the entire transportation sector is, is wrestling with. Um, so Andrew, um, you know, you're an, an urban designer, you're a trained urban planner working in an architecture firm. Um, and have you seen interest in the changes to urban design that will facilitate more multimodal travel and walkability uh, in your practice? And how do you feel we can accelerate this? I think um, it's a great question. I think um, yes, uh, I'm seeing it from our clients are asking for it, right? So I work for local governments, I work for um, institutions, universities, do a lot of campus planning, I work for real estate developers, um, those are three key buckets of clients, and in every case, it's it's a given, we're talking about complete streets or streets for pedestrian and, uh, and bikes, in most cases, that's the majority, uh, which is a good thing, and I think that that, that shift is happening, uh, because people see the economic value in creating walkable urban places. People see the return on investment from walkable urban places. I do think the film could 
concentrate a little bit more on land use, to be honest. I do think land use drives transportation um, in, in a lot of ways. And it, it, the film mentioned urban density and walkable places for sure. And a lot of it, the imagery was there. But the metrics on you know dwelling units per acre and increasing density, you know, Chicago is doing this through our transit-oriented development ordinance. Um, and the parking, I'm glad parking was covered as well, um, because as much as I'm an urban designer, um, I think with clients they they like they, I'm like a parking therapist to them, and helping them understand and balance their their needs to, for minimizing parking demand in order to maximize um, other benefits of, of new development and redevelopment projects. And then finally, you know, we're, we're, play, we're doing what Gabe Klein mentioned in the film and, and retrofitting streets and working from curb to curb or from parcel line to parcel line to reappropriate streets. And we're doing this in Detroit and in Philadelphia and in, and in Chicago and projects we're working on right now. Great, thank you. That's a helpful perspective. I like that you mentioned land use. There are a lot of people that, that say um, the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. Um, and that's, cer that's certainly true for biking, walking, and transit. Um, so um, another aspect of the film that I, I, I really like is sort of thinking about, you know, how, to, how do we incentivize these shifts? How do we um, make this shift? Um, one of the speakers said, life in a city is a constant negotiation. What changes are we willing to make for the greater public good? And another one asked, how do you incentivize people to make the right choice? So um, this is a question for any one of you. What thoughts do you have on how we shift the personal transportation choices, the individual choices, to those that are most beneficial for all? Yeah, I think this is really where policy has to come into play. Because I have a sort of um, pragmatic idea about behavior change, which is that you can't expect individuals, especially in something um, as you know, functionally oriented as transportation, to be making choices based on the greater good. I would love to think that everyone would be ideologically motivated to to go out and you know do what is going to result in the optimal you know greenhouse gas and safety outcome for the community. But I think uh, we can never expect individuals to do that. We can expect individuals to optimize for their personal experience, right, and for for their personal financial needs, safety needs, um, you know, the the time that they have to spend, the the comfort that they have um, in different options. And so the, the role of policy is to uh, direct funds and make decisions about allocation of space, about design, um, such that that individuals are faced with an environment that shapes, you know, that that essentially draws them toward the things that result in the the, pub, the best public good by making those the best experiences, by delivering the most value when people choose the options that will result in the greatest social benefits. And so that means we need to focus on a, a policy architecture that will result in that incentive structure. And um, I think then the, you know, there is an accompanying political question of how you get support for those policies, right? It can be a little bit of a chicken and egg problem if you don't, you know, people who aren't yet participating in that sustainable uh, behavior, how do you get them to back, uh, you know, give the cover to the politicians to make the right choices about what needs to happen? I think there's definitely a public dialogue that needs to happen there, but it's fundamentally, you know, it has to be a partnership between, um, you know, between a policy decision and then um, the resulting kind of landscape of choice architecture that's available to the public. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that that um, you know in order for people to make the right choice, they need to have choices first. And I know that there we have so many communities where um, they don't have those options of there's a difference of being car free and being um, uh, carless. And I think in, in in some instances, people feel like out, the automobile is the the one vehicle that allows them to access um, everything that they need for their daily lives versus, um, you know, being having um, being without the option of um, moving up or having um, um, a, a good uh, sustainable way of, of, of life. So I think when we, we start thinking of incentivizing, I think we, we, we still need to start thinking of what are the choices that we have in any given a city in any given space first, and then start thinking of how we can actually be, how our policies set in place and what are 
the programs and, and options and resources that we are providing to people so that they actually understand those choices and what those choices are. Um, I have a colleague that she always says, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> so, um, you know, if people just don't understand what is available, what is possible and how that affect them and also how that choice allows or provides, you know, it's a choice for the better good of everyone and not just for your individual good. Um, that is an education process. Uh, but again, I will just like to emphasize that before that, we need to provide the choices. We'll need to change the funding recipe too, even more so than has been done before. So I think um, um, through through public-private partnership and working with the private sector is one way to do that. And I think intergovernmental coordination even more so, especially between state departments of transportation and local departments of transportations. And then of course, I think the big question here, you know, with, with, with the Biden-Harris, um, uh, with the president-elect is the future of transportation at the federal level and how that works works um, uh, from, a, from a Department of Transportation there. Because I think all those things can address the incentive structure and kind of build on what Emily and Romina were saying, so. Yeah, great point that we're thinking about right now a lot. Um, so the film asks us at one point, you know, what do we value? And suggests that the next phase of transportation investments should be like those values and that, you know, I don't think we haven't actually made that a proactive choice uh, so much up to now, uh, but now we're at a place where we're sort of taking stock. Um, so what thoughts do you have in terms of how do we step back to assess our values and help them inform future transportation policy? Like, how can we do that? That's a great challenge. I mean, I think it um, it connects maybe to what I was mentioning earlier about this need to have a public conversation to help really give space to the policymakers to make the right decisions about funding and design. Because I think if you can have you know a, a public process that involves people and asks people the questions about what they want their experiences to look like, you know, what, what kind of transportation would really serve them on a day-to-day -day basis and meet those higher order needs that they were talking about in the film, right? I never thought about kind of Maslow's hierarchy in the context of transportation and even, you know, feeling self-actualized by the way that you get around, but I love that. And so I think if we, um, this obviously is something that a lot of planning processes aspire to achieve in their public outreach components, um, but I think ha developing a public dialogue supported by really high level um, high prominence initiatives from city leaders that express an intent around, you know, the goals of the city and then engage the public around what, you know, they want that, that to look like, whether it's around climate goals or around safety goals like Vision Zero um, and, and um, engaging folks in, in painting that vision. Then what you have buy-in on the end result that, that people want to achieve and, and that helps put the wind in your sails on a a political process to enact uh, the implementation that's necessary. It reminds me, what you're saying there it reminds me of, you mentioned leadership, Emily, and I think as a way to reflect values about health, about choice, about the environment, right, uh, about convenience. And I think when um, former Secretary of Transportation LaHood, right, Chicago and Ray LaHood, when he um, when he joined the Obama uh, Obama's cabinet in 2008, he mentioned about the changing way of balancing um, um, not favoring any one mode when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to funding, right? And that was like a mind shift for me at the time, at least, and many many others probably felt the same way about changing the way the funding recipe works um, as a, as a reflection of values, and it has to happen with great leadership. And um, without that, I don't think it can trickle down. Right, um, Audrey, I think that's a really good question about values, and I feel that. Um, the last few months or, or years, that's something that we have all really been reconsidering. Uh, what do we value as, a, as communities, as a country? <laughs> um, and, you know, I would say that at least for, for Americans, you know, I think at the core of a lot of people, uh, 
Americans value, we value private property a lot. And I feel like that's been, you know, when we have vehicles as an extension of that property, I think it's, it was Enrique Peñalosa who mentions that, you know, everyone has the same right to the road. You know, the kid who's walking the same, that has the same right to, you know, a person who is driving this huge SUV. But we don't see that uh, reflected in the way that, again, as Andrew was mentioned, in which and we uh, fund and invest um, um, and also in the policies that we have in place and ultimately how our spaces look like <laughs> um, and how they are designed. So I think, you know, as, as part of looking inward and trying to reevaluate, re like, what are the values? What do we value? I think helping the true policies, true leadership, uh, how do we make this power shift to uh, helping everyone to understand and aspire to this collective power that we have we all have this right to occupy the space no matter what um i think there's also mentioned that you know um leadership and um cities government should look for ways to sometimes i think they they use the word like imposed by force um you know this idea that everyone has the right and I know there are, there have been some countries, um, and, and I know for sure in Mexico, they have changed some of the constitution to say that every citizen has the right to open space. Um, so this whole idea of, of a collective um, ownership of open spaces, and that is a shared ownership of the space rather than um, emphasizing so much in that idea of private ownership and private property and how that extension of taking that ownership beyond you know our houses beyond our rooms it's affecting the way that we use our spaces the way that our spaces look um, the way that we're investing in, in public space yeah i mean almost um investing people with a sense of pride of collective ownership over those right. those public goods rather than just sort of pride of personal ownership over over private goods i really like the way you said that and it gets back to what audrey said what you said in your opening remarks about mobility as a human right i think you read that right from um from npc and i wrote that quote down in my notes here i'm like that's a really big idea right there and um and i think if we believe it to be true we have to put our put our words to action yeah, and I think it has a it has a lot to do, at least in this current context, with um, who's using which modes and how much power they have, and um, you know how much ability to influence and um, what even what things our leaders have experienced. So that that transitions into the next question of um, you know, given that so many people in America have grown up feeling they didn't have another choice than driving, or they they just didn't even think about it how do we get people to think about mobility in a broader way so they do not oppose every change that prioritizes another mood other than driving and i know this is something that you know all of us deal with in our professional lives you know what have you learned in your experience of you know kind of how to deal with that i think we're making progress um in you know just in in having a lot more infrastructure and choice that people can experience in a, in a metropolitan area. Uh, you know, coming back, we're sort of reversing, trying to reverse the scars of urban renewal. Um, that's pretty much what I do every day. Um, and so I think we're making progress. I think there's an educational component to it and an experiential one, especially with, with uh, young people being able to experience different modes of transit, being educated on different modes of transit. I think that could be enlightening. And then I think, how can you incentivize people to think differently about, about land use, especially in suburban areas of this country, still growing suburban areas of this country, right? And um, and that's where it's, it's, a, it's a bigger challenge, I think is right in that, in, in the suburban landscape right now, um, about how you can introduce new modes of mobility in, a, in suburban settings, even with slightly lower densities, and, um, and how, you can, how you can approach that to, to get choice to those neighborhoods. Yeah, and I think, you know, Andrea mentioned two really key 
parts of that is the education and really having those conversations with younger people. Um, and I think sometimes it's not so much the message, but also the messenger of like how you're communicating and getting that message across people. So like, you know, sometimes we as planners and, you know, we can preach, <laughs> you know, what, what should happen, um, what, what is best for people, but it doesn't, the message sometimes doesn't get across until someone else translates that information into a way that is more approachable to, to people and reaches people and reaches really the community. Um, and I think, you know, really good example here in Chicago, we have Vitel uh, with uh, Think, Out, Think Outside the Block, and he has been just is this amazing ambassador in helping younger generations understand that the um, the avenue to growing and being someone in the community doesn't mean that you need to own a car. Um, and it's great to have conversations with him and like his own journey to understanding the difference of you know being mobile uh, and then being bound to this you know automobile, this thing that now you have to pay for it and take care of it and um, clean and so forth. Uh, so he's been organizing bike rides in in Englewood and in the community to really communicate and and get that message across that it is cool to you know, don't not have a car to own a bike and to walk to places um, and this health aspect to to more active transportation to most um, active transportation modes um, and that mode shift. Um, so again, I think um, collaborating and supporting people who already understand that to provide the information that they can actually communicate to other and to other communities. I think that that that's also um, key as part of um, you know, thinking, um, changing this this way of thinking um, and actions. I think something that's been an interesting lesson from all of the, the slow streets kinds of implementations that we've seen during the pandemic is that very often the fear of these infrastructure changes greatly surpasses what, you know, the actual negative reaction would be from the community once people experience them. Because um, what we saw was that, you know, due to the, the, you know, the need for very quick action um, during the pandemic, um, people, you know, put in a lot of these temporary kinds of measures, um, you know, city staff and a lot of cities like Oakland, where I live, uh, were able to do that and transform people's experience of their street to make it much more pedestrian and cycling oriented in a short period of time, but in a non-threatening way, because it was done with uh, removable materials that didn't require a lot of public investment. And the response was, was so positive. And it, you know, I think that it, there were certainly like um, iterations that were necessary to allow those prog programs to really listen to the feedback from different communities about whether the particular ways that these programs are implemented met their needs and then allow them to be adjusted, um, you know, really take into consideration the different needs of, um, you know, of different parts of, of town, different types of streets, um, people who have different levels of access to public transit, um, and, you know, and work at different times of day, things like that. Uh, but ultimately, I think, you know, we learned that we could actually make a change on a widespread basis much more quickly than we might have expected if we had just had, you know, three years of meetings about whether or not we should do this, right? And, and hopefully we can carry that forward in some of our approaches, even outside of a crisis. It's like never, never waste a crisis to innovate in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, this obviously is a serious crisis that, you know, it's, it's affected many people in, in a terrible way. And I think um, we would never want to recreate this, the, the constraints of this situation out of choice. Um, but there are lessons that can be drawn from it that I think can be incorporated into um, the way that we roll out infrastructure changes in the future. Yeah, I think you're you're noting that we've learned new ways to get public engagement in a way, like these pilots with temporary uh, infrastructure where people experience it and then give feedback loops. It's, it's perhaps a new a new model that we can do more of. Um, so Emily, I wanted to uh, get your insights, given your extensive experience with Lyft and the new mobility uh, community and and tech um there there was a fair amount of uh discussion of of tech and the need for a platform for all transportation data to be integrated and then it's government's role to enable this what's your perspective on how we've seen this evolve in the u.s and what do we need to do to make this happen and for this to really work 
Yeah, I do think this is key. I mean, if you're talking about wanting to get people to use something other than a car, I think really right now, a lot of those options are not legible to a user who doesn't have really extensive information about what mobility options are available in a city. Like even just arriving in a new city, you don't necessarily know how to use the public transit system. What form of payment is available? What are all the other on-demand transportation options that might be out there? And when they do exist, you know, they're they're scattered across all of these different access me mechanisms, their own apps and and payment systems. And so, um, to achieve something that is a more legible, unified approach. Um, where people can come and see all of those options in a mobility as a service kind of a format, I think you really need to look at um, open data standards because there, there's a great temptation on the part of the private sector to try to create these silos and to, you know, to lock out access to their, to each mode's especially the private modes, particular customers, so that they're the only ones that can communicate with their customers. It, from a business perspective, that's desirable. But from a public interest perspective, I don't think it's desirable. I think that the public will benefit if um, policy uh, requires that there are open protocols that allow you know, any purveyor of transportation service to um, you know, essentially have APIs that can be integrated into um, other platforms so that you, you can bring in all of those options into a single place rather than having quote unquote walled gardens that, that separate those off and, and keep them siloed. Um, and there are you know, rap rapid um, improvements in the development of data protocols now on an open source basis that can you know, create the um, you know, clear standards for how those integrations could occur. And we, you know, we certainly need to, um, you know, to involve private sector um, developers who are the, you know, the technologists that um, have developed all of these private systems in that conversation and, and make sure that what we're, you know, we're, we're putting together is something that, um, that will really deliver the quality of customer experience that, that riders of these services expect because there can be something lost in translation sometimes when you're, you know, you're piping in some, you know, information about a service that's delivered by company A over here and you're trying to display information about that service over here in another place. Um, you know, sometimes the companies fear that there will be a, um, you know, something lost in translation that will be to the detriment of the customer experience. But I think those problems can be solved for through an appropriate um, kind of like open stake, uh, stakeholder consultation process and open source development and really result in um, a system that provides a lot more possibilities for how to package this information. What I don't think that we should do is have government become a software developer and have government try to create the master app uh, because it's really not their expertise. I think it, it's much better for government to say, here are the open protocols that all the people in the private sector have to make available and then allow them like, you know, whether it's transit app or city mapper or, or you know Google Maps or whoever wants to come in there and pull in all this information and create the best interface for consuming that um, and you know make sure that your public transit agencies are also participating in those open protocols so that you can have transit booking and wayfinding within those services as well. It, it creates some market competition for um, for the best mobility as a service product that I think will be really um, useful to advancing consumer adoption. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Was that nerdy enough? Yeah. Yeah, no, that was that was perfect. It's sort of it's a little bit of the wild west uh, right now, and seeing how things settle down, and and um, certainly you know Los Angeles established these data standards that are are providing a start for for uh, standardization uh, of these data sources. Um, now I want to just turn back to um, you know equity issues in transportation. We got a question um, asking about, and I know this is something we're, we deal with every day, I need to deal with more in Chicago, um, the barriers to equitable public and active transportation. Um, this person writes that they're a huge supporter of complete streets, but many times those investments are driven by development, um, you know, developers coming into a community. How do we bring that into neighborhoods that have had long periods of disinvestment? Um, it can be a chicken or egg dynamic, but transportation can 
be uh, an impetus to help transform neighborhoods. So this is a this is a complex and difficult uh, issue to answer, but I'm sure Ramina and also you know Andrew from your uh, city design experience have you know have run into this. What are your thoughts? Maybe Ramina first. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, Audrey, you said this is a very complicated question. Um, you know, it's there, it can be addressed in so many different ways, but, um, you know, just trying to, to keep it, uh, short and brief, um, you know, how, how it gets done. I think that would be, I know that the city is still trying to, um, implement and figure out how they're more equitable in investing in, in different parts of the city again in a more cross-sectional way rather than um, addressing one issue at a time um, one good example is um, the invest southwest initiatives um, across the city they are prioritizing and looking specific at some corridors and looking at business um, you know business redevelopment or business investment um, design of the streets, um, safety, and, and so forth. So that is, um, again, looking at how how is the city approaching and improving the policy so that we're, we're not only addressing one issue at the time, but looking at uh, investment in a more comprehensive way and more equitable. We know that um, in those areas in the city, um, and I'm talking specifically in the, in the, in the south um, side of the city, west side of the city, when we're looking at infrastructure, our communities, they, are not, they don't only need infrastructure investments. They need um, a whole array of investments in those communities. So investing only in the complete streets will really, um, um, will just like try to do a Band-Aid on, you know, in this um, very deep wound um, of our city. So we're talking about historic um, disinvestment uh, for so many years um, and also some other structural um, issues that have um, harm um, our communities in those areas. So I think how it would be looking and and pushing the city to to continue doing those more cross-sectional um, investments in those communities, so that we're looking at not only infrastructure but investment investing and reactivating of spaces and adding more density into those spaces as well. Um, Cause we know that there's so many vacant lots and we have lost so many, a lot of population um, in those areas as well. Yeah, that's, that's great, Romina. I think you hit a lot of things I was gonna mention as well as a very good answer. I was just thinking about Invest Southwest and what, what the Lightfoot administration is doing to reverse subsidy and specifically fund and incentivize um, investment in um, neighborhoods that are economically distressed, right? And underinvested in historically. I think the population shift component to you, that you brought up um, is also significant. The city, the, the most economically distressed neighborhoods are those depopulating the most quickly in our city. Um, and there's this intensification of the stratification across an equity spectrum, right? Um, across across our city. And so, it, you know, it is a two cities narrative to a certain extent. Um, but I was, just, I was just, you gotta change the, the legislation uh, around TIF, for example, and um, and then what we do in the city of Chicago for housing, right, for affordable housing and the density bonuses from downtown development, transferring that to the neighborhoods, perhaps something similar for transportation, so you can have streets of dignity in, in communities of color, specifically on the south and west sides. I do think you know, certainly the transportation infrastructure and housing investment in communities that have not had investment is is critical. Uh, and I think when it comes to housing policy and kind of how that relates to the pressure of development on um, on lower income communities, I think that you know we also have to take on some of the the politically challenging needs to actually um, increase density of development in high income areas, right? Because otherwise you end up um, always putting the developments in the places with the communities that have the least ability to kind of stand up and um you know and, and protect their communities because it's politically easier um and that has results in you know much more displacement instead i think you know we need to talk about uh eliminating single family zoning we need to talk about you know some of these sacred cows that um that get held intact meanwhile we go talk about needing to to develop, you know, places where um, where there are people that that aren't haven't been as effective in, you know, voicing their needs. That's where the legislative aspect comes in. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the legislative aspect on zoning, absolutely. I underscore that one. And you know, with the city of Chicago um, enabling accessory dwelling units recently as one example of that. And yeah. The city of Minneapolis, of course. That's ready. such a great dark horse. We've been able to do that in California as well. And meanwhile, you know, seeing that there's tremendous opposition to uh, to other kinds of housing production legislation, ADU uh, legislation has been very successful. So it's it's helpful, but also we have to be mindful, look at the long-term consequences and see how much it actually results in um, more, uh, you know, people who aren't already in the same family being housed versus people using those units for, um, you know, for family, for home offices, Airbnb, whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah, everything's connected. We have another comment here kind of highlighting the connections that were made explicit in the film about climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, and public health and transportation. And a lot of professionals have been talking about that more lately. Um, But this person is observing that this, that politicians are not talking about this. Um, And how can we get these discussions to be happening in the right circles to affect change? This now week not I'm hopeful. Time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this week I'm more hopeful than I used to be. And I mean, I seeing the people that have been appointed to President you know, elect Biden's transition team for for transportation. You know, not only do you have uh, Gabe Klein, illustrious former CDOT um, commissioner, but you've got um, people like Patty Monahan on uh, California Energy Commission. You know, people um, like. The, uh, Austin Brown from UC Davis Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy, who are, are very focused on um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions through transportation. And I think that that issue of climate is, is very much at the top of the agenda for the Biden administration overall. And they're going to be looking at ways, um, not only in transportation, but across every policy pillar of their agenda to find ways to incorporate emissions reduction. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity for that. You know, And they also frankly on the transition team included a lot of people focus on transit, which is a lot more than I can say for, you know, for the current administration that's kind of did everything to move its focus away from urban areas. So um, there's a lot of likelihood that we'll see investment in that. But I think we it's always, you know, a challenge to work with the current funding programs as they are. And there's a lot of inertia behind that in Congress, right? So especially without control of the Senate, um, knock on, on wood in Georgia, I'm just going to be unabashedly partisan, sorry. Um, like I think, uh, that's going to have a lot of impact on how much we can actually change the funding formulas that determine a lot of these, how these priorities are, are dictated. But the Biden administration probably will try to do as much as they can through executive power. I think that's that's great, Emily. I think just on a regional level, um, I think more inter intergovernmental cooperation and coordination you know, especially in Illinois with all of our various jurisdictions, you know, with the, with the efforts of MPC and CMAP, you know, more intergovernmental coordination and good leadership there can help um, can help address it at a regional scale when we, you know, when we're working in, 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 uh, in large metropolitan areas. Great. So let's see if we can do maybe just um, one more question. Um, you know, I think uh, this one's just related to, to biking. We've seen under COVID the explosion of cycling and bike shops being sold out. Um, wh- what are your thoughts in terms of sustaining the positive changes that have occurred during COVID? How do we, um, you know, how do we keep those things going and, and growing at, at, you know, once we maybe have a vaccine or as we emerge from this crisis? continued investment in infrastructure and it's been amazing what Chicago's done in the 15 years that I've lived here even you know um, in just generating momentum for a bike more bikeable city um, and I think it's, it's to sustain it means ex- I think extend the network um, and I think um, that helps incentivize people to to do that and I'm, I'm talking about bike sharing as well as as well as bike lanes and the, the hard infrastructure too Yeah, and I think along those lines, um, which I know that um, Department of Transportation in Chicago, they've been talking about it when it comes to investing and expanding the uh, the bike bike bikeways network, thinking beyond just connecting 
um, our neighborhoods to downtown, that, that idea of commuting, but networks have really interconnect neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. rethinking the way that, like, what, what are the destinations? Where do, do we want people to go? And incentivizing the um, people to bike to more places um, for those daily um, trips that they can take. Um, I feel, and also for, for recreation, uh, connecting with parks and other networks in the city are key. So definitely when it comes to investing, rethinking and reevaluating how we're investing in our networks. Um, and I think, yeah, again, um, as Andrew mentioned, the city has been doing a great work um, also expanding the DV network um, and um, having more of those e-bikes, which are amazing. They've, you know, saved me a lot of times of getting late to um, reconnecting for meetings, <laughs> um, suit meetings. So, um, but yes, um, investment is, is the key in here. Um, I would definitely plus one uh, what you said, Romina, about uh, focusing on the non-commute trips. That really gets, you know, a, a insufficient focus, even, you know, historically, but there's been far too much um, kind of focus on commute trips and not enough focus on whether it's, you know, with transit or with active transportation infrastructure on the needs to, to serve non-commute trips, which are actually very high percentage of of total trips that people take. And that's definitely true when we're thinking about our um, our parking infrastructure networks. And I think it's even more true now because um, certainly during the pandemic, but possibly even moving forward, you know, we're seeing all this remote work and people in this kind of, um, you know, orbit of their own homes in their local neighborhoods, spending all that time there, um, you know, rather than going on the hub and spoke to, you know, to get to work every day. And so that, only increases the need for that focus on neighborhood level kind of uh, connecting uh, bike infrastructure. And then I, uh, I agree with your enthusiasm also about electric bikes. And I think that is a huge thing that we really need to be thinking about how to make it easier for more people to get introduced to, because once you try it, it's so infectious, right? It's awesome. It's like, talk about incentivizing people to do something. Like once you get someone on an electric bike once, they're like, Holy moly, I'm Superman. Yeah. This is the best thing. So um, totally blowing out the scale of electric bike share, I think, is a really, really good idea, right? Making sure that the highest percentage possible of the bikes that are in a bike share system are electric and that you're continuing to really grow the number of devices that are available, introducing other micromobility options in there. Uh, but then also, you know, I don't know whether this is a, a, a local policy issue, but certainly at the state level, something that I'm bullish on is the idea of um, purchase incentives for electric bikes, because I think, um, you know, micromobility, uh, it's a tough business model that we can only expect a certain amount of speed in the growth of, and of those businesses. But I think owning your own electric bike is something we should make it much, much easier for more people to do. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's incredibly cost effective in terms of, you know, dollars per greenhouse gas emissions reduced compared to like an electric car incentive, for example. Um, so we should we should try to advocate for more of that those kinds of policies. Well, it's and the good news, is that, yeah, and the good news is that Chicago is undergoing that transformation right now with our with our Divi bike share uh, rolling out a lot of electric bikes and people are having their first experience riding and and I love that we're ending on the note of of joy being part of transportation and and fun um you know so superman on an electric bike will be the image that we leave that we leave everyone with um this has been a great conversation uh, i'm really glad we had such a great turnout um Romina, andrew emily this has been a, a great conversation thank you so much for joining us um we also want to thank perkins and well and smart go once again for their sponsorship and support of this program and as as has been noted, we've recorded this panel and we'll be sending out uh, a recording as follow-up for those of you um, who'd like to share it. So um, I think with that, we're gonna wrap up for the night um, and thanks for sticking with us and, and showing up tonight. So thanks from MPC and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.